taking the time and joining us here um, at our at our uh, at our monthly general meeting. And uh, I would like to acknowledge that we are all on the traditional lands of the first people of Washington who inhabited this land for thousands of years before Europeans arrived. And we would just like to honor those people past and present with gratitude to the land itself and to those tribes. Um, I think it's just really important for us to remember uh, who's, whose land we are occupying. Um, Great, so uh, give a quick uh, board update. Um, Caitlin, do you wanna do that on our, on our board meeting? Or I can? Uh, I'll get my mute off there. Um, <clears throat> yes, and I apologize everyone. I am doing some COVID and my <laughs> voice is not sounding the way it's supposed to anymore. Um, at any rate, uh, the big thing to report from the board, um, Burl has done a really lovely job of um, looking through our bylaws and has been um, cleaning things up. And one of those pieces is um, making sure our language matches our practice when it comes to board elections. And so uh, this is official notice, there will be written notice uh, following shortly that we will be holding board elections in September um, at our September meeting, which means that um, if you are running for the board, we'll be able to go ahead and take those speeches at our next August meeting. Um, we just made those decisions this morning. So uh, look for sort of a written version of that coming through your email here shortly. And um, I know we've had a few conversations with folks who are interested, but if you haven't had that conversation with any of our board members when you are interested, uh, feel free to reach out. Any of us are happy to talk about what that experience is like, what that time commitment's like. And um, I can promise you to the one, every single person here will tell you it is really an extraordinary experience to work as closely as we get to work with one another. Just really leaders in the industry there's a great opportunity for additional leadership development and um and all of those sorts of things so I strongly encourage you if you've ever considered it um to really look into it this time and um we look forward to keeping our ideas fresh in the organization moving forward and that comes with um fresh leaders uh, a part of our decision making team so i uh, would love to see any and all of you consider that opportunity Excellent, <clears throat> thank you. It is truly an amazing group of people and I've had the privilege of getting to know everybody better over the course of the last couple of months. And I feel privileged to work with this group and uh, would encourage anybody who's interested in getting more deeply involved uh, to please consider putting their name up for election. I think the more robust set of candidates from a cross section of um, of licensees and non-licensees throughout the state is really going to improve the quality of this organization. And it's a great group of people to get to work with. So um, I, I couldn't ha more highly recommend uh, getting involved and, and being a part of the board if you've got the, um, if you've got the wherewithal and, and the gumption to, to take it on, please join us. Um, great, okay. So for a uh, legislative update, um, I just wanted to let you know, and, and we've been talking a bit about this, that it is campaign season. So um, we've got a, an election upcoming in November for which we're gonna have both uh, state and national candidates that are up for election. And so one of the things that we've devised uh, is we started a grassroots political uh, organization to uh, better address our, our political needs as an industry. And so um, we are in the process of reaching out to all of the licensees in the state, including our membership, and letting them know about this grassroots campaign. Ultimately, what we're looking for is to engage with the candidates during this primary season so that um, we are in lockstep with the candidates that support common sense cannabis legislation and regulation, and that we are supporting them both with checkbooks, which are I, I get are, are direly pinched right now, given the state of the industry in, in, in the state of Washington right now, um, but it's necessary if we want to make some changes We've got to both dig in with our wallets and we've got to dig in with 
um, our, our shoe leather <clears throat> and get out there and work for the candidates that we need to get elected so that we can, when the time comes in the next legislative session, we can actually move some um, legislative policy initiatives forward. Uh, and I think that's critical to create a, a <clears throat> policy package to address a lot of the current concerns in I-502. It's been 10 years now since 502 started, which is kind of hard to believe. Uh, but <clears throat> given our experience, given the number of other states that have come online, given <clears throat> everything that we know about the state of cannabis in the state right now, uh, it's time for a rewrite and it's time for a major rewrite. Um, we've been reaching out to legislators, we've been reaching out to uh, LCB board members and having a conversation. And what's been clear and coming back to us is that the legislators are open to an omnibus bill to fix I-502. And we're, we've taken a call calling that Cannabis 502.0 um, and it's time for a major rewrite. <clears throat> and so it's not just going to be, hey, here's a patch, here's a fix, and you know we need to change this. It's desperate. This is dire. <clears throat> this needs to change. But it's across the board rewrite. And what we'll be doing is creating a, 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 a 502.0 committee within the alliance to address these issues. Um, we're going to be having conversations with stakeholders across the industry, including legislators and regulators. And we want to be able to, to create a, a framework that better addresses the situation as it is on the ground today and address the reality of the cannabis industry in the state so that we can uh, continue to advance uh, vital, vital, ethical, sustainable, equitable cannabis companies in the state. And that's really our mission and what we think about every single day when we're trying to get this done. So the idea is major rework of cannabis laws so that we can create an even playing field so that we've got common sense regulation that works for the industry instead of um, blocks the industry at, at, at every stage and makes it more difficult. And, and frankly, <clears throat> what we're seeing is that the good actors are getting penalized in the current system. So there's lots of stuff in there that doesn't make sense that lots of companies just ignore because it doesn't make sense or find a workaround because it doesn't make sense. And the good actors that are trying to adhere to the letter of the, of the law and the regulation are getting penalized because there's tons of stuff out there that doesn't make any sense that is, is blocking companies from carrying on ordinary um, business practices. And so that's the, that's the motivation behind this. Um, we, we, we think we can get to a consensus of, um, of bilateral legislators across the board, reaching out to everybody and, and get everybody behind this and actually get this passed in the next legislative session. So that's our priority. And it starts with a kickoff of the grassroots campaign. We'll be sending out an email next week <clears throat> to all of our membership and to all licensees in the state to let them know what we're doing and how they can get involved. And then we're going to continue to update people with um, information about what's going on in their district. So we've, we've fortunately got a, a, a computer software program, which allows us to update people district by district. Uh, on what's going on in their district. So we will be providing that information to our membership, to other licensees in the state, so that they can show up to fundraisers, doorbelling events, um, other things like that. Let them know who the candidates are in, in their district and so that they can come out and support. And we can have conversations with those candidates now about what we need as an industry to change in the coming legislative session so that we can achieve Cannabis 502 and create some real legislative change um, that's going to that's gonna basically be a rescue package to an industry that's um, under siege right now. And we, we, we hear the pain coming from licensees within the state, and we're doing everything that we can to address that and try to affect some real change. Um, and we need everybody to dig in and, and help us get that done. We're not going to be able to do it alone. It's got to come from you, the membership, you, the licensees, uh, people that care about creating a vital industry in the state. 
And so uh, this, is, this is a call to action and we've got to do it in a unified manner. We've got to come together as an industry, all of us, and agree on the change and then present a unified front through to the legislators. And that way we will actually get something done. If we can agree as an industry, hey, it's not gonna be the best package for everybody, but it's gonna clean everything up and it's going to meet most people's needs. If we can agree on that as an industry, then reach out to the, to the legislature, craft a new bill, <clears throat> cannabis 502.0, and then reach out to the legislature and say, here it is. You've only got one bill to vote on. This is all the fixes that we need and we need to get it passed and we can do it. I truly believe we can do it. We're gonna manifest that change. So we're, we're doing everything we can on this end, but we, again, we can't do it alone. We need all of you to participate. So please, please, please join in and we'll get some stuff done. Uh, so there's gonna be a fundraiser for John Lovick uh, that's coming up on July the 26th in Everett at a pub called Sean O'Donnell's. And that's gonna be from 5.30 to 8 p.m. So everybody in the area, everybody that can come out. Um, John Lovick is, is, a, is an ally to the industry and somebody that we need to see um, back in office. And so if, if you can, please show up to the Lovick fundraiser, again, coming up at Sean O'Donnell's in Everett, 5.30 to 8 p.m. on July 26th. Uh, <clears throat> webinar Wednesday this week is going to be a can candidate roundup replay. So our legislative committee looked deeply into the candidates that are out there running for election right now. Uh, and we put together a list of allies that we need to see return to office. And it's a bipartisan list um, of people that support uh, common sense cannabis legislation. And, are, and, and the industry in this state. And so we've, we've got a list of those people. We talk through that list. Um, it's gonna be up on our website as well. And that's part of our grassroots campaign as well. So if you haven't seen that, great information there, um, please jump on. It's gonna be available on, on Facebook Live. It'll be on our YouTube channel. And we encourage wide participation in that event. Um, so please take a look at that and get involved and we can do this together. Okay, uh, Gregory, I saw you jumped on. Do you wanna kind of give us a, an update from the Cannabis Observer? Sure, um, hello everybody, good to see you today. Um, so provide a update from the as far as what's happening on the regulatory side of stuff. Um, three topics today. Um, we'll look at the social equity rulemaking work that's going on and, and the effort in general. Um, then quickly run through active and uh, potential future rulemaking at LCB as well as the Department of Health. And then let's wrap it up with a conversation about Canopy. Um, so on the social equity piece, um, this has been moving along for quite some time. Uh, the latest update was on Tuesday, um, at the board caucus. Um, so the LCB, um, has waited for a while um to implement rules to establish a new um social equity applicant retail licensing window so this will be the first time that uh retail licenses have been in this case reissued by lcb um since 5052 um and so the agency has been deferring uh their rulemaking process um, first for uh, waiting for the, the legislative task force on social equity and cannabis to issue recommendations. Um, that really um, that really happened in January of this year for the most part, um, the, the recommendations that they needed to move forward. And so now they've been in the process of doing rulemaking to really kind of set the parameters around this application window. 
And um, in mid-May, they actually withdrew proposed rules to work on them some more. Um, and we've asked them multiple times about why they actually felt the need to withdraw rules that they had already put forward. And we're pretty vague about it in general in most of their responses. But on Tuesday, um, uh, following some critical public comments the week before, um, the board members had uh, both policy and rules manager Kathy Hoffman and director of licensing Rebecca Smith come in and, and talk to that some more. And so apparently they've been speaking to some outside experts and we're gonna hear from one of those outside experts on Tuesday um, during the board caucus um, on July 19th. Um, Colette Holt um, is gonna be presenting um, and we don't know a lot about Ms. Holt, uh, but what we were able to dig up um, is there in that link. Um, and she has done a lot of, uh, uh, apparently nationally known for doing disparity studies for, uh, for, for government entities. Um, and that's about as far as I've gotten, as far as her expertise. Uh, but in general, the agency continues, like the, the overwhelming concern um, the, the, the leading concern that I think most people have is that depending on the, the kind of scoring rubric that's established um, or that's codified in, in rule in this case, um, if there are any challenges to that code, that scoring rubric, uh, legal challenges, it can put everything on hold. And that has often been the case if there is race-based criteria um, uh, as, as part of that scoring rubric. Um, and so we've seen this around the country, right? Like uh, Washington is not alone in trying to establish social equity um, programs to, um, and so we're seeing that in Illinois, like uh, licenses there are held up. I think there's been challenges in New York, um, in Connecticut, Arizona. So, you know, it's a valid concern. Um, you know, I don't know what, you know, from my perspective, I feel like litigation is kind of inevitable. Um, and I think the agency thinks so too. Um, and so we'll see what happens. It'll be interesting to see what that presentation is all about. Um, meanwhile, on the social equity task force, um, they have really kind of in this, this past, uh, well, in 2022, they've really kind of shifted their focus to finishing up their required recommendations um, and just basically issuing a report this December. Um, and so their approach to hosting public meetings has gotten more uh, succinct. Like the meetings are now an hour and a half long. There's often not public comment really encouraged. And so they're really focused on just doing, meeting the letter of the law and Getting their issuing their final recommendations. Um, I don't know if we're going to actually even see um, agitation or not agitation, but uh, organization to um, propose like a, a, a framework for a bill next session, right? Coming from the social equity task force. I think it's all going to be wrapped up in their recommendations that they intend to have influence cannabis policy making in general for for years to come but you know it's a report um i don't know if i'm my skepticism is is coming through as far as the the power that that group has is able to wield at this point um the next work group meeting coming up is the production work group which is uh uh devising recommendations on um, moving over licensure of producers to the Department of Agriculture, where they really kind of belong. And so this is there to be their second and final meeting coming up. Um, then the other work group that's active right now is on nonviolent offense policy and uh, a home grow. Uh, odd, odd pairing because they're just trying to get this done. And so the nonviolent offense policy meeting was this last week. Um, no need to really go into that at this point, unless folks are interested. And uh, the home grow one is uh, the next meeting will be focused on home grow. And so 
Um, I hope that folks will uh, make an effort to, to chime in on that one. Um, and I hope that the Alliance will get behind efforts to, to move home grow this next session. It's way overdue, um, though I don't know if that makes sense paired in an omnibus bill. It probably should be its own thing. Um, anyways, that's social equity stuff. Happy to talk more on that piece since we're been observing all of that since it started in Washington State. Caitlin. Um, and just to follow up on, on that um, encouragement on home grow, um, John Kingsbury is on that, that work group um, and the Alliance, we've spent the last couple of months talking about a variety of strategies because we wholeheartedly agree we're really, really behind um, on just about everything as far as it, when it, as far as it comes to home grow. So um, we're certainly working in concert with the Social Equity and Cannabis Task Force and, and any other group that wants to join this effort because because it's going to be a heavy lift, but it's certainly one that needs to be lifted. So, yeah, but I think the um, I think it's actually a really uh, compelling argument um, that home grow has disproportionate or would have disproportionate influence and help um, from an equity perspective, and that would be really good to to kind of ally those causes. Um, all right, let's move on to active and future rulemaking. Um, let's see, the main one just to keep in people, people's minds at this point um, is the ongoing rulemaking around cannabinoid regulation. Uh, so um, LCB deciding if they have changed their mind about the extent of the authority that they have to write rules around THC compounds other than D9 and um, other compounds that can be found or derived from cannabis plants. And so that's just continuing to move along. Um, the last pretty interesting exchange um, that was organized by the LCB was this deliberative dialogue on the subject of cannabis impairment at the end of June. And we just finished writing that one up. That was the dialogue um, that uh, Ms. Hoffman invited Bia Carlini from the Alcohol Drug um, Drug Abuse Institute. I always forget the, the name, ADAI. Um, and she's been kind of on point for a lot of the um, concerns around concentrates that we see from the prevention and research communities. Um, so Bia Carlini was there. Um, Jillian Schauer, who's the executive director of the Cannabis Regulators Association, CANRA, um, was also there. And uh, uh, really interestingly, Steve Fring, who uh, was formerly with King County, uh, Seattle and King County Public Health, uh, kind of on the alcohol prevention side, but also had this side gig with the Northwest High Intensity Drug Trafficking um, uh, Task Force. Uh, from a prevention and treatment uh, perspective. And so it was really interesting to hear the three of them um, kind of go back and forth in some ways, right? Like, um, and so I, I encourage you to check out that, that write-up. It was, it was uh, interesting. And of course, like they don't have any sort of consensus agreement about what makes cannabis impairing or actually most of them were thinking that it was really a red herring in general and that LCBs wasting their time trying to define impairing. Um, so the next thing coming up is July 28th. There's supposed to be a listen and learn on uh, the draft rules around this, which haven't been released yet. And that listen and learn has been pushed back multiple times now. So now we're at the end of the month. Anyways, that one's going on. Future rulemaking. Um, let's start with the Department of Health. Um, so the awesome Mr. Kingsbury uh, submitted a petition to the Department of Health to please, for the love of God, do something about those logos on compliant products because nobody knows what it means and they are terrible and evidence of the total lack of interest that the Department of Health has in cannabis other than preventing its use. So 
um, he heard back from them that actually they weren't going to do that, but instead they were going to open up the whole chapter, but they didn't really say for what, and so kind of inferred it could be included in that, but I'm a little skeptical. Um, I think that they're probably going to make the changes that really are kind of necessary after uh, HB 1210 was passed this last session, changing marijuana to cannabis in the RCW. You know, LCB has done their work to finish um, updating their uh, part of the Washington Administrative Code to change the language. DOH has not, WSDA has not, uh, so I think they need to do that. But um, John also thinks they may be doing some other stuff. John, are you with us today to kind of speak to your theory on that one? Whoops. Uh, so I'm, unfortunately I've gotten, I've written to them three times for clarity and I get these vague responses back. And um, so they say they will do the logo. Um, I think that they're going to, um, I know when Shelley Rowden was at the agency, there had, it was clear to me there had been considerable discussion about changing uh, the definition of compliant product, which is um, 246.70.040. Um, and so I know that at that time they were looking at changes that might make it easier for producers to produce it? Would that be changing lot size? Would that be stuff like that? I don't know if that's still their thinking. I can't get that out of it, but I that might be a part of it. Um, it seems pretty clear to me. Um, one word that came back in one of the responses was taxes. That was a word they wrote in an email with nothing filled out. So, um, Gregory may remember that um, there was a tax, um, there was a committee to review tax preferences and that would be the 10% um, sales tax preference for patients who have a, a recognition card. Um, there's not many people in the database compared to other states, but um, what they said at that time is that anything that a patient buys is DOH compliant product with regard specifically to taxes. Clearly that is an, was an extra legal interpretation and having talked to them, they know it. I have a sense that at least one thing they're gonna do is try and backtrack themselves and cover themselves in the administrative procedures department. I don't know, does that mean they have two definitions for DOH compliant product? I don't know, but um, I got the, they made the suggestion that that was it. What really bothers me is how vague they're being about it, even though I keep trying to go back to them and get the specifics. Um, so I think they'll do the logo. I think they'll do a tax thing. I think they'll probably um, look at, can we make this more um, less onerous for producers to put this product out? Are there role tweaks? Those are my guesses, but I really don't know. <laughs> so that's a long way of saying I don't know. But uh, I think all of these things are probably on the table in their thinking. Did you uh, have a sense on the timeline around that, John? So I pushed back and pushed back, and they said that they should have a CR 101 within a couple of months. I don't believe that at all. I heard that for, I heard it'll be six more weeks for almost a year and a half on the, um, on uh, the consultant training. So they've said two months, uh, but, you know, do I believe it? Nah, you know, we'll see, right? So. Yeah, and um, there's also a, a new uh, marijuana program manager uh, uh, over at DOH, uh, Shannon Angel, who I think, is she from LCB? Did she formerly work in enforcement in LCB or licensing in LCB? I don't know. I haven't looked that up. Would, that would be something worth doing, right? I guess. I mean, I just don't know if she has that perspective or, you know, influence perhaps. But um, anyhow, um, and rulemaking at DOH is just this complete other 
kind of black box in some ways where they have part-time rule coordinators that help with that particular program, I think, and uh, are splitting time on other, uh, in, in other complete areas. You know, DOH, the scope of what they do is rather enormous. And so uh, they just move at a lethargic rate um, and hardly at all with regards to, to cannabis. So yeah. thank, thank you, John. It's clear to me that there's a lot of behavioral health people making the decisions there at DOH and no, I've asked them for one non-behavioral health medical person who's in the decision loop and they couldn't come up with one. So the, the, the you know, the deck's a little bit stacked over there. Um, I don't yeah. know, I hate to be pessimistic, but this is what I'm seeing. So well, I mean, we have, many years of, uh, of experience around this one to have uh, uh, some reservations about how stuff is gonna go. But thank you, John, for continuing to, to push over there and for representing the patient voice so well uh, uh, to our state officials. Um, moving on to the LCB future rulemaking, um, we've heard before that um, staff are interested in reopening um, rulemaking around packaging and labeling, as well as advertising. We've heard that for a while now, and they just haven't been able to work it into their schedule. Um, and um, we've talked before kind of a, like our guesses about what that might be about. Um, and it sounds like their schedule is not getting any less packed because uh, this last Tuesday, uh, Ms. Hoffman seemed a little miffed that she had received six petitions for rulemaking since July 6th. Um, and it so happens that July 5th, I think the, the board members kind of encourage people to submit rulemaking petitions. So uh, you get what you ask for, I guess, sometimes. Um, anyways, the things that we know are on that list of, of potential petitions received at that point and a little bit before, um, Someone submitted a petition for curbside and walk-up delivery, which was a uh, temporary allowance allowed um, uh, during, uh, during the uh, COVID stuff. Um, and we should probably see that one um, for board approval or rejection on next week is we're expecting. Um, but previously, like, uh, staff had said that that is not something they could do because of some stuff in statute. So um, if they're going to stay consistent with that, they'll probably reject that petition and say, you got to go to the ledge. Um, I'm aware that another petition for uh, allowing minors on wholesale licensed premises is in the mix. Uh, that was also a temporary allowance. And that is something within the scope of the um, agency's authority they could do um, and have seemed willing to, to take that step. Um, then Hoffman mentioned someone asked about cloud services for licensees. And I'm guessing that that might mean uh, storage of um, things like certificates of analysis, um, uh, that sort of thing in a, in a a state managed resource. Um, so they are uh, reliably accessible and generally accessible across software integrators, but that's just my guess. Um, someone submitted one about sampling rules. That would be nice. Um, and we actually wrote about um, trying to, uh, we actually wrote about sampling a little bit this morning. Um, and talking about how things are handled over on the WSDA side for uh, the hemp community where WSDA staff go on site and perform sampling and take it to a testing laboratory to ensure uh, chain of custody um, uh, uh, for, for those. So that would be interesting if that conversation got opened up in a rulemaking capacity. And someone else submitted one on vertical integration um, and addressing that but I'm not sure, honestly, I, I don't know if that is something that is purely within LCB's uh, authority to address. Um, and then someone else submitted one on Canopy. So we could transition over to that particular subject, which has uh, come to the fore again in the last 
six months or so. Um, so here's another link to a recent discussion um, about Canopy. And so this has come up again because you may remember that um, the Director of Enforcement and Education, Chandra Brady, um, she's relatively new on the job. She's been there a good while now though. And one thing that she noticed um, apparently around fall last year is that there was no written protocol for measuring canopy. And this has been known since the canopy measurement days. Um, you may remember there was a um, canopy measurement team several years ago, um, uh, I think within the examiner's unit that went around and mm, did a sampling of canopy measurements. And um, uh, actually, I think Mr. Hunter, Lucas Hunter is on the call today who managed that team at LCB. And um, uh, my understanding is that he actually asked LCB staff to uh, accept a written protocol at that time. And Lucas, I see you came off uh, onto video if you wanna maybe briefly speak to what you saw back in those days. Yeah, definitely. Um, yeah, this was a while back, but um, when I was uh, doing the marijuana um, campy analyst team work, it became really clear that there was no policy procedure really statutory language or rule language around how campy is measured, just vaguely what canopy uh, is. So I brought forward a um, basically an early model of an interpretive statement that the Liquor and Cannabis Board would put out, um, kind of got an agreement with um, uh, Zube and uh, Becky Smith, um, Brian Smith, and um, Kendra, um, with you know the board members' uh, awareness to a certain degree, we all kind of came to an agreement. Yes, this makes sense. Let's move forward with this. And then uh, maybe a week after the publication came out, there was some pushback, and then there was a lack of acknowledgement that there was unified consent, and we went back on that. Um, also, throughout the entire time that I was doing the campy teamwork, enforcement was incredibly hesitant to acknowledge um, enforcement wasn't a big fan of me to begin with. Um, they felt that we were stepping on their toes. But there was, a, um, there was a very clear line that was, this is how the campy team measures, this is not how enforcement measures, yet enforcement had no procedure of how campy was measured. So it's funny to me that we're coming, you know, now years past this, and now this acknowledgement of, oh, we don't have a way to measure canopy. And, it seems rather silly to me. I'm glad that you know it is getting acknowledged now, and I hope that we can have more clarity. But um, you know that bulletin that came out from Chandra, including walkways and aisleways, is uh, troublesome, right? So th that's kind of like the brief history of um, my dealing with trying to get some sort of policy in. And um, it was just to reiterate, it was fascinating how quickly you know, uh, and unified enforcement was at rejecting that this, my team's policy and procedure around measuring Campy was definitely not how enforcement would measure Campy. However, it was the only thing that the LCB had in a uh, procedure or internal policy on how to do so. Thank you, Lucas. And you and I should take some time to catch up again and um, like to, to document some of that history because we're gonna be talking about this more um, over the next few months. And I wanna make sure that that's part of the discussion. Um, so, uh, so, you know, fast forward into this fall, Brady saw there wasn't a written protocol um, and initiated that process, I think around October of last year from what I gather, uh, she's been kind enough to accept some calls uh, with me about this. Um, and so, the AAG signed off on it. Um, they ran it by um, some of the trade associations. I'm not sure which ones in particular in late November 
Uh, we saw a copy of it mid-December. This is the internal protocol specifically for enforcement staff. Um, in January, they published a post on their, you know, newsletter, their quarterly newsletter on Medium uh, about Canopy, you know, just sort of saying, oh, this is, this is uh, what we've been doing all along. Um, and, and that's the message that I've heard repeatedly from enforcement. This was sort of implicitly um, the, 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 the very general way that everyone except for a couple of officers uh, haven't been able to identify whom or which particular licensees benefited from an alternative interpretation. Um, and so um, January that came out, um, April, they actually released a, you know, a document specifically for producers to be able to understand and follow after which they began receiving more complaints that no, this is actually not what we were told is the method. And, um, and then we saw backtracking in late June and early July. So it seems that um, the board is of their own volition going to open up a new rulemaking project, I think in August um, on Canopy. And, you know, it would be one thing to just sort of encode these uh, particular, um, this particular approach in rule. Like obviously it needs to be in rule. It should be something that's quite public and visible and understandable by everybody if this is what we're gonna do. But why don't we also take this opportunity to ask what Canopy is for, which is allowing the board to have a measure of control over production, right? Like that's the purpose of Canopy. Is a square footage measurement doing that? I don't really think so because you have differences in growing techniques where indoor producers can do many, many crops. Um, you have greenhouse, hoop house, outdoor production, they use different amounts of square footage to do their work. Um, do we have CBD imports into 502? That's not having a closed system to control production. Um, and we saw the synthesis of Delta Dine in particular from CBD um, up until fairly recently, and not sure anybody's really keeping track of whether that's still going on. So um, we're going to have biosynthesis of cannabinoids um, uh, also here fairly soon. So, you know, a square footage of plant canopy, I don't know if it's actually, you know, or even a volumetric measure. I'm not sure that that is the right approach. But you know, open that up for discussion if folks are up for it. Um, what would be a better means of controlling production than square footage? And we don't have to talk about that also, but in general, that's yeah. what I've got today. Happy to talk about other stuff. Thank, thank you very much, Gregory. Again, we so much appreciate the work that you do. You are the eyes and ears of the industry on the regulatory and, and legislative front. Uh, we, we'd be working blind without you doing the great work that you do out there, uh, or it would occupy an enormous amount of all of our times just to try to keep up with everything. So uh, thank you very much for the work that you do. And, and everybody, please, uh, you know, try to support the, the great work that the Cannabis Observer does. Uh, it's, it's critically important. It was critically important to me when I was running a cannabis company in this state uh, to be able to know what was going on and be able to interact based on the information that was coming out of the Cannabis Observer. So thank, thank you very much again. Uh, Lucas, good to see you again, sir. Thanks you. Thank you for joining. Uh, love to catch up with you soon um, and talk some stuff over, but I appreciate the good work that you're doing as well. Um, so, uh, yeah, really, you know, all of this kind of dovetails into Cannabis 502.0 that we're talking about. 
we need to make some serious rulemaking changes and revisit some of these things like canopy based on square footage that originally seemed to make sense, but now given the state of the industry 10 years later, I mean, we'd never heard of synthetic cannabinoids. Well, we'd heard of them, so obviously the spice and K2 and things like that, but never you know, dealt with the, with the volume of synthetic cannabinoids coming out of the hemp industry and how the back and forth between the hemp industry and, and 502 is interacting. Um, this is stuff that we desperately need to clarify and get rulemaking on. And, and again, we could fight these battles on a hill by hill basis, but I would rather fight a war on let's get it all figured out. Let's get together as an industry and say, yes, this is something we can all get behind from retail, from, uh, from producer processors, from, from every licensee's perspective and uh, get something we can all live with and then present a unified front to legislators and boards and say, hey, this is what we need. This is what we want. This is the one bill, get behind it, pass it. And then, and then we can start individual fixes off of what is hopefully a greatly revamped and improved system. Cool. Uh, thank you guys again. <clears throat> uh, so committee updates, um, patient caucus and Therapeutic Cannabis Community Group. Um, I've, I've been attending these sessions. They're super helpful for folks out there that are um, that are patients, and, and I've been one for twenty plus years now. Um, this is a this is a great opportunity to get together and talk about stuff that works, that um, impacts health. It's it's a it's a wonderful group of people. So if you've got some uh, and, and you're a patient and, and, uh, and want to participate in the therapeutic cannabis community group, um, we're doing those online uh, every other week. It's a, it's a Zoom meeting. Um, Caitlin, can you update on, on dates and time on that? Um, yeah, so it's the first and third Thursday of every month at 2 p.m. on Zoom. Um, last week, we talked about best practices for uh, communicating with your healthcare providers. Um, and we're also working on getting a patient resource page together for the Cannabis Alliance website. And so I'm just discussing what, what are some one-stop easy check uh, info items that, that patients can, can access uh, for sort of smoother existence of status, whether that's finding a provider or um, product that's safe, et cetera. Uh, excellent. And um, so John, do you wanna update us on um, what's going on at, at Bellingham Budfest from your group? Uh, so what's going on? What's going on is I'm running around trying to gather stuff together. Uh, we've got, um, we've got some free meds for patients and then we're going to present, um, information for patients. I think it's critically important that people, uh, cannabis enthusiasts and the community is reminded that for a certain percentage of the population, cannabis is serious medicine. It's not just good fun. And, and so we're going to um, try and act as a resource um, about that, but also gen we're, part of the purpose is to try and generally raise the awareness that, that cannabis is medicine for some people and it's life-saving medicine for some people. So uh, we will, um, we will be giving away some free meds. It's been a hoop to sort of, we've had a lot of needles to thread here, you know, to stay within the law, but also sort of push the boundaries. So um, we will have some protocols. I think we have enough volunteers, but you know, if you wanna show up and work for an hour, that's cool. Um, what we would ask is that you, if you're gonna be there, come say hi, come in, you know, see what's going on, uh, mention it to other people. Um, I will also be, I don't know. I think I'll be part of the 502 panel. Um, I don't know. Caitlin, you're not going, are you? I saw Caitlin's name on like 50 panels or something. No, so. we're still sorting those things out, but <clears throat> 
COVID uh, struck at a really inopportune time for me in Bellingham Budfest. So uh, I may be reaching out to you to fill my spot on a few of those panels. <laughs> okay. So for this group, one of the things that we're going to talk about um, and make people aware of is uh, medical grade cannabis, uh, whatever that looks like in a year, uh, 24670 product. Um, so that'll be part of it. So uh, if you produce that, um, you we I probably asked for your name to post your logo there. Um, there can't be any compensation or any of that for j just to keep you guys out of trouble. Uh, I'm not a licensee, so I have a certain amount of uh, leeway that you guys don't have. Um, but still, it's been a trick to, like I say, thread the needle. Uh, we're going to talk about that product. We're going to talk about authorizations. Um, I'm going to try and push people to my uh, patient survey, um, which you may or may not be aware of already. I like to update it every two years. Um, what else is going to be on the table? I'd have to think about it. But uh, the purpose here is really to, to raise awareness that there is a thing called medical cannabis and it matters. So um, that's probably not the bulk of the market, but I think it's a, it's a super important part of the market. So is, it, is that what you're looking for, Burl? <laughs> Yes, sir. Thank you. Uh, I appreciate the work that you do as well. Um, yeah, so we'll be talking about home grow. We'll be talking about patient issues. Uh, home grow is another critically important thing that John's been working on for a long time. And uh, that's critically important to patients because as we as we talk to people in our in our therapeutic community group every every session, uh, people can't afford their meds. And if they can produce a couple of plants at home, they can produce RSO by themselves without uh, outside interaction. And they're not having to, having to spend you know, hundreds or up to $1,000 a month uh, in order to access their medication. So I think this is something that uh, is important to everybody in the industry and something that uh, Cannabis Alliance really stands behind and something that John's been pioneering for a long time. So um, thank you very much for the work that you do. Can I, can I take uh, minutes to? No. Okay. Yes, I'm kidding. Uh, no, so, go ahead. Sorry. Um, a couple of people at LCB approached me about, um, about uh, making uh, patient specific products more from the producer to the patient. I know that um, I talked to Matt a little about that, um, but if that's a conversation, you, you'd like to have. Um, it, it wasn't well-defined. It was, uh, there were two pieces and I'll try and make it super quick. One is could, could producers and processors make uh, to order medicine for patients? Uh, and then the other one they approached me about was um, could some of the smaller farms, would they be the, would they be interested in um, say holding 30 plants for a patient? And 30 is more than a patient can handle now, even if they're in the database. Um, and I said, I would, I would reach out and ask, you know, those entities, if, if those things are sort of interesting to them, um, or rather it'd just be a pain in the butt to them. But um, on those two particular issues, um, reach out to me if they seem like something you want to discuss so we can get a conversation going. So. Anyway, that's it. That's my two minutes. Thank you. Okay, excellent. <clears throat> Thank you. Um, equity and justice working session. Caitlin, do you want to touch that? Um, yeah, I just wanted to make sure Jess wasn't on before I took over. Um, <clears throat> yeah, so the equity and justice committee um, has been working on uh, defining next steps, still very heavily uh, involved in looking at what our um, expungement situation here is in Washington state. Um, we're going to expect some legislation upcoming and um, the committee is looking at putting together a long meeting, uh, a, a working meeting to really start hammering down and, and defining some uh, steps moving forward. So if you are interested in receiving communications about when that is going to be, or even contributing your availability uh, to make sure that you can be there, please feel free to reach out to myself or I'll put um, Jessica Puchardo's uh, email here in the chat. You can also reach out to her. I'm really excited about some of the ideas that we've been discussing so far 
far. And it's just a matter of uh, many hands make light work. So we'd love to have you on board for, for some of those initiatives as they're coming out. Awesome. Uh, Kim, do you want to touch community outreach? Hi. Um, so we, uh, the Education and Outreach Committee, had a tour last month uh, in June of Skagit Organics, and it went really well. It was a wonderful time to gather, and um, Matt with Skagit did a fabulous job of uh, taking his time and explaining everything, and everybody was very excited and very impressed. And um, because they also uh, have a hemp line, it sort of planted some seeds that perhaps uh, maybe the next tour we could do would be of a hemp farm. So we are checking into that, and that might be happening in August. We're still trying to get all the um, seeds in a row and uh, we'll let you know about that, but it would be great if uh, some of you could join us for that. And the Education and Outreach Committee uh, is all about education and about outreach. So taking what the Education Committee is doing and bringing it out into the community because there's still so much work to be done in the education of the populace about um, cannabis and hemp and all of the good that it does. So the Education and Outreach Committee meets the second Wednesday of the month from 1030 to noon. And if you'd be interested in joining us, I'll put my email in the chat and please just let me know. We'd love to have you. And that's it. Awesome. Do you want to jump into member highlight as well? Yes. Absolutely. So um, Member Spotlight is where we take a little bit of time to learn uh, about some of our other members so we can build a stronger community and get to know each other and support each other's businesses. I really hope that anytime you have a need that you reach out to one of us or me, I'm the membership person, I'd be happy to um, let you know if, uh, if you have something that you're looking for, if we have a member that provides that service. And so today we have um, our member spotlight is uh, Parker Smith and Feek, and we have Ryan Moses today, and he's also got a couple other members here as well. I'll let him introduce them. And uh, are you yeah, ready? Absolutely. Ryan, absolutely. Share all about your business. We're excited to hear about it. Well, Thank you for being here. Absolutely. Thank you for having us. Of course, we we love the the discussions we've had up to this point. I was you know talking just the other day on the on the. Um, the happy hour, your community is an awesome one. And we're just excited to be part of it. With me today, I brought in Michael Hennessy, who he's kind of, um, well, not kind of, he is the practice group leader for uh, cannabis across the country for IMA, which is our partner, uh, excuse me, our, our parent company. I've also brought Andy Hunthausen with us. He's a commercial insert and insurance agent. Again, really focused and, and locally trying to be the, the, the PG owner here as well. And then myself, I do the employee benefit side. And then Ray Cho is also with me on the, on the benefit side. But I wanted to get Michael a few, uh, maybe a minute or two, just to kind of talk about what we're doing across the, the country and get a little bit better of an understanding of really who we are and what we're about. Yeah, thanks Ryan. And, and thank you everyone and, and Kim for the time to talk about what we do and, and why we're here. Um, so as Ryan mentioned, um, Parker Smith and Feek is part of IMA. IMA is a, a large commercial insurance firm. Um, I know everyone cringes when they hear insurance, but what I will say, um, some of the things that are unique to our company is we're an employee owned organization. Uh, we've got about 1800 professionals. And when I say employee owned, 80% um, of them actually own shares in the company. So it's not just a select handful of executives that do it. And I say that because um, it's a lot different when you own something versus when you rent something. And we're, I think, the second or third largest employee-owned brokerage firm in the country, especially at that volume of ownership. Um, I'm based in San Francisco. Our, our parent company is headquartered in Denver. Uh, I've been supporting the cannabis industry for about six years on an insurance perspective. So this isn't something that we're just dipping our toe in or we're new to it. We have teams throughout the U.S. that support every time zone, actually, um, dedicated professionals to claims. I know property and theft has been a huge issue in Washington in the last you know, 12, 24 months, actually probably even a little longer. Um, but I, I kind of want to share some of that because this is something that we take very 
seriously, both on the medical and recreational side. Um, you know, we work with groups, and I think in 32 of 37 legal states, um, you know, startup companies, and we have some proprietary offerings designed for kind of single license holder um, companies all the way through. We have clients that'll, a client that'll do over a billion in revenue this year, and, and I would think about seven or so that'll go over 150 million. So uh, I kind of want to share that with the group, just so you have an idea of who we are, the types of companies we support. Um, Ryan and Andy are, are kind of boots on the ground, if you will, local to greater Seattle and Washington in general. Um, but as Parker Smith and Feek are, are becoming newer to cannabis, I want to assure everyone that the teams that will be kind of the behind the scenes support are the groups that have been doing this for years and the teams and infrastructure we already have in place. So I know, again, they're new to the Alliance, um, but I wanted to share a little bit about that. We're, we understand it is incredibly difficult to own and operate a cannabis business and the financial burden and, and hurdles that you go through are second to none in any other industry. Um, and, and I'm kind of going through that firsthand uh, in a little different avenue. We're, we've built an insurance vehicle that is designed and by law required to be owned by cannabis companies. So I know insurance costs are, are typically on the high end compared to traditional business. Well, the margins and the profit that the insurance companies typically would see are now gonna be regenerated and in, back into the vehicle that we've built and we manage but is owned by cannabis owners and operators. And it's by law designed that way. So we actually have a few members already uh, committed in, in Washington. Um, I've, I've been rambling a little bit. I, I wanted to keep it to a couple of minutes, but happy to answer any questions about who we are, what we do, the types of companies we support, how we could be a resource um, for individuals and or the association as a whole we, we have a pretty significant amount of experience in doing that. So um, I'll, I'll pause here, open up for questions, comments, um, and or just hit mute and let everyone continue on with the, the program. <laughs> <laughs> the insurance I'll... questions just rip in right now, right? They're just coming, <laughs> coming big time. <laughs> and I'll be, I'll be brief. Michael covered a lot. I'm Andy. Um, I'm out of Tacoma area. Um, I'm also just getting over COVID. We have a two-year-old and a four-month-old that had it too. So um, explains, explains the, my voice. But um, no, really, really happy to be a part of, of the Alliance. And I, um, Ryan's done a good job of, um, you know, getting us in and, and getting us to know you guys. I missed a happy hour the other night, but really looking forward to participating in all the events coming up and being a true supporter of the community. I think that sometimes insurance folks can can seem a little transactional and we really want to be a partnership um and 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 really see see it continue to flourish in washington so yeah we write um we work with all things cannabis a to z and and really excited to help where we can and and uh, i think that you'll find with us too we're not we're not a very salesy brokerage we really just want to 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 you know be called to the table when there is an opportunity to help so um, we have a great product. We're really excited to, to present that and, and have opportunities. But I think that um, we're one of the largest brokerages to finally commit uh, to the cannabis um, uh, world, you could say, and, and be able to bring our real estate construction, all of that risk management, loss control, and, and, and bring that into to our space. So really exciting. Awesome. Well, thank all of you guys for being here and particip for participating. I see that um, Kim's put up a, a link to your website. Um, so if people are interested in more information, please feel free to, to hit up the website. Uh, I, I, I know as a, you know, speaking from a, somebody who was a licensee, uh, you know, insurance is a critically important part of what we do and working with a company that understands the cannabis industry, there's only a very few uh, companies that actually operate in the cannabis space and working with somebody who truly understands what we're dealing with as licensees makes a huge difference uh, in being able to put these packages together. We have to have it. Uh, it's critically important. And so I want to thank you guys for um, providing that service to people. It's great to know that you're employee owned um, 
and that and that you understand the, the cannabis space. So if there's any any other like informative links on your website that that can talk more about your program, feel free to drop that in the chat as well. So people can um, ping on that and and uh, and get some more information or, or reach out to you guys directly. Um, and and a couple of your contact information has been dropped in the chat as well. Uh, and, and, and thanks, Ryan, for joining Happy Hour the other day. And hopefully we can um, see, see more people. I, I, this is a shout out to Happy Hour as well. I didn't talk about that earlier, but um, you know we, we do a happy hour. We get together. It's social. Um, smoke some weed. Have some chats. Sometimes they're silly. Um, sometimes they're fun. But a great group of people, a great way to hang out. And in this time of COVID resurgency, uh, again, it's it's uh, you know it's it's not a joint circle where we can pass a joint around, but we can sit in a community group and um, and get high and uh, enjoy each other's companies and and talk a little bit about um, what's going on in our day. So that's awesome. Appreciate it. So just want to mention too that all of our members are listed on the CannabisAlliance.us website under the. Um, uh, membership tab. And of course, um, our, our member spotlight today is going to be there. And um, if anybody's interested in um, being a member spotlight, please reach out to me. Be happy to chat with you about it. And thanks so much for all of you being here and for your support and membership. Awesome. Kim, thanks so much for the work that you do in membership. If you guys don't know, uh, Kim is the, is the backbone in communicating through to our membership and uh, you you are the you are the face of the alliance to a lot of our membership, and really appreciate the work that you do as well. So so thank you. <clears throat> right back at you. I can't. I'm 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 heart challenged, but yeah. Okay, cool. Um, and then member announcements, Caitlin. Are you yes. still Copus Mentis? <laughs> sort of. Uh, <laughs> um yeah i can literally just fall asleep in this chair right now um okay um but i will rally for this meeting always every single time so um this is sharing some news from the full spectrum um neil lakia is actually on his way up to bellingham right now in preparation for bellingham bud fest and he wanted me to share a couple of events that are um coming up for the full spectrum with this weekend um, and that is that the full spectrum is co-hosting the official Bellingham Bud Fest pre-party. That's tomorrow, Friday at Wild Buffalo at 8 p.m. in Bellingham. Um, I hope some of you can go and have a good time for me. I think it's going to be a really lovely time to network and see some of the family now that we're starting to head back out again. Um, and then Saturday, of course, uh, is Bellingham Bud Fest. Uh, and I'm just going to make this a joint announcement about Bellingham Bud Fest. It's a great event. Uh, you heard John talk about the patient uh, caucus booth that will be there. We also, as the Cannabis Alliance, will have a separate booth uh, just for ourselves. And then also Full Spectrum will be there at booth 104. Did I say this out loud or not? It's from 12 to 6 at um, Zuanich. Am I pronouncing that correctly? Point Park. Um, and really look forward to seeing you. There is also going to be an after party on Saturday at 8 p.m. at, wow, and I'm really not going to pronounce this correctly for you Bellingham native folks. Maybe you can help me out. Schweinhaus. All right. Yeah. Um, I'll put all of this in the chat as well. Um, and then this Sunday, um, you can join the full spectrum in the Bellingham Pride Parade. So Bellingham's doing a little bit later than everybody else, but uh, what a great opportunity to show your allyship or your pride um, and support the fact that um, uh, the cannabis industry owes quite a bit to the queer movement um, and legalization. Um, we'll have flags, whistles, weed necklaces, handouts, and more, and that will be from 12 to 1 p.m. If you have any questions about any of this, you can reach out to Neil, and first and foremost, and I will get his email here in the chat. So um, I hope for everybody that's going, you have a really good time, have just a little fraction extra for me since I'm not going to be able to be there, and then all of that together, I'll just, the universe will send me good vibes. So that's just my personal request. <laughs> Thank you.
Pearl, you are on mute if you are chatting to us. Sorry about that. I, sometimes I'm not on screen, so I don't even see that I'm muted. Okay, yeah, um, Bellingham Bud Fest, um, please be there. I will be. Um, lots of fun events, should be great. Uh, weather promises to be fantastic. Um, great way to get out and see everybody and um, take care. Uh, if if Caitlin is a is a um, is is a, a message of of uh, uh, stay healthy, uh, wear wear masks. Everybody, especially when out in public, um, there's don't share joints. There's lots of this going around. Um, this these these Omicron variants, the BA four BA five variants are uh, resistant to immunity. So if you've had past COVID, if you've had, um, your, your, um, vaccines and your boosters, you are still eligible to get the variants. They're as or more transmissible than the original Omicron variant, and they are making people sicker. So, uh, if you haven't been get vaccinated, get boosted. That's your best defense against um, a, a deadly illness, hospitalization, or a serious illness. And wear a mask. Masks are actually very successful in preventing transmission. So even, even outdoors, and it feels weird, um, wear, wear a mask and try to keep everybody safe. And we will Sorry. have Cannabis Alliance masks at Bellingham Bud Fest. So if you're there, come swing by and, and grab a branded mask. And they're the nice big kind, so you can double mask with them comfortably as well. And yeah, they're if, awesome. I like if it. you've got a glorious they, beard like Ryan does, it also provides, accommodates for that. <laughs> I wish I had a glorious beard. <laughs> All I can grow is the ZZ Top beard that kind of goes straight down, but you know, maybe I'll take a couple of years and, and push that out. Well, there will be room. You can just roll it up and tuck it in. Let's see. Yeah, just like I wanna, that. I want to get the, I wanna get the <laughs> side twisties. Uh, no, my wife would not put up with it. Um, yeah, not, not, not going to be a hard, not going to, not going to work. Okay, uh, office hours are every Monday and Friday at, um, so are they both at 11? Yeah, it's from 11 to one every Monday and Friday. 11 to one every Monday and Friday. Caitlin, Jill, and I will be online and available. So for all of the membership, if you've got questions, if you wanna communicate with us directly, uh, please jump on. We're, we're sitting there waiting to talk to people. Half of the time, um, we're just talking to each other, but uh, this, this is open to everyone. We do these office hours so that you can communicate with us directly. If you've got any questions, concerns, issues, ideas, uh, or information that you want to share with us, hop on office hours. It's the greatest, easiest way to talk directly to all of us and uh, we get lonely sometimes, so please just jump on and, and say hi. Uh, happy hour every Tuesday at four o'clock. Webinar Wednesdays, again, legislative campaign roundup. Uh, join the Facebook group and check out the YouTube channel. A lot of this stuff is available, including general meetings that you may have missed is available on the YouTube channel. Lots of great information there. Um, great links to everything being being put out in the chat here. So um, if you if you need more information on any of the stuff that we're talking about, open up those windows in the chat and then you'll have them. Um, yeah, any, anything else we'd like to say for the good of the cause? Has anybody got anything else they want to share with the group? Um, just because things have been fast and furious, I do want to make sure we take an opportunity to say welcome back to Jill, who just well, returned yeah. at the beginning of the week from maternity leave. So thanks, Jill, for coming back. <laughs> Jazz hands. Yeah, there's nowhere else that I'd rather be, guys. It was, I mean, I was happy and thrilled to be able to take the time. And, you know, I want to thank you all and the Alliance for, for giving me that time to, to bond. But it's good to be back and it's good to see everybody. Um, you know, and this is, this is my family too. So it's really, really wonderful to see everybody back. Well, we're psyched to have you back. Uh, there's a ton of work to do and Jill is the driving force behind 
a lot of the work that we do in the Alliance. So thank you, Jill. I'm psyched to have you back. Um, we're, we're uber happy and it's a great work group and we're getting stuff done, more importantly, uh, for the benefit of everyone. Eric, did Jill you know? knows how to do stuff. Jill knows how to do stuff. <laughs> you know, on occasion. Lots of stuff. Jill can yeah, get I, it done. <clears throat> Thanks, Burl. I had a little bit of an announcement too. This is actually going to be my uh, last meeting where I am joining you from Seattle. Uh, I am uh, happy to announce that I'm relocating to Lisbon, Portugal in 12 days time. Uh, so wow, congratulations. I, uh, I, I am maintaining my Alliance membership. However, I, I want to emphasize that this is a bridge building move, not a, uh, not a farewell. Um, <clears throat> Hempfest, Seattle Hempfest is also, in addition to my own business, Maristomatics uh, Analytics, uh, I've already opened up my Portuguese entity for that, but Seattle Hempfest is going to be scaling globally. And we're already working actively with partners in Lisbon. And I am happy to say that we are going to be um, having a Hempfest in Lisbon, Portugal on September 24th, 2022. Uh, we're putting a final touch. We're still juggling between two different venues, but uh, we're pretty sure we're going to have the big one. And uh, yeah, we're off to the races. It's, um, it's going to be awesome. Uh, one of the interesting things about this Hempfest in September too, is I'm working, back, uh, I'm working with a local CBD distributor and they're going to be handing out a bunch of free smokable hemp at this Hempfest. So we're going we're gonna to enter the European market with a big splash. Uh, so if you, uh, anyone, if you want to hit me up at, at eric at uh, hempfest.org, if you're interested in, um, you know, globalizing your message at all, uh, we're, we're still actively taking on sponsors. And if you think you're ready for a, for a European scale, I'm sure everyone heard the news that came out of Germany last week. Uh, they've just approved their, uh, they, they've just given the green light on their recreational program. So figure the dominoes will fall rapidly after Germany in Europe. And uh, so if you've ever had a uh, site on that market, now's the time. And I am happy to uh, be your liaison uh, from that side. My uh, email is eric at hempfest.org and I just dropped it in chat. Thanks so much. I'll, uh, from everyone else's perspective, that's uh, these meetings take place 8 to 10 p.m. Lisbon time. So I'll, I'll still be here. Um, I just might look a little more relaxed, a little less stressed. <laughs> well, here's well, to that. Hey, uh, congratulations. Um, I might, you got a spare couch in that place? I might, might, hit, might hit you up for a little visit. Yeah, you know, it's, uh, it's, uh, it's a cool little place we have. We're uh, in Algiers, just outside, about uh, 15 minutes by train from downtown Lisbon. So um, it's a very welcoming community. I, I encourage people to come visit. And if you're uh, dust off the passport, even if you don't want to sponsor, do something business related, come over and party with us in September. Sold. Booking my tickets. Right. Careful with how you give that couch information out to Eric. We're all going to. I know, all right? <laughs> pitch, pitch a tent in your backyard. Yeah, we're going back to apartment living, so it's going to be uh, it's going to be downsized life, but it's a it's a big family there. So nice, plenty. Nice. Of well, I'm, I'm psyched for you. I'm glad to hear Hempfest is going to continue, and uh, I I love your plan for global domination. At least uh, at least global education. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, nice. bro. Yeah, we're nice. we're looking forward to it. Uh, my email's in the chat. If anyone wants to, uh, if anyone wants to chat further about it. Thanks for your time, everyone. Awesome. Anybody have anything else they want to talk about for the good of the, good of the group? Okay. Well, um, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. All of you for the work that you do every day for the, for the struggle to make the cannabis industry better in this state to to supply jobs and quality medicine to, uh, to people in this state. Um, thank you, thank you for the work that you do. I know how hard it is 
and we've got your back. And um, please, please, please continue to be involved. Continue to work with us to help uh, fight for a, for a vital, ethical, equitable, and sustainable cannabis industry in this state. Um, now more than ever, you matter, and um, we can we can do better. We can make this better for everybody. So thank you for joining us. Awesome. Okay. I love all of you. Thank you so much. Thanks, Thanks bro. Thank day. you.